All right, good morning, everyone. We're uh, just gonna get set to go live. If I could just get everyone to uh, mute your phone and your video, it just helps the stream. As we're getting uh, our numbers go up, the Zoom product is uh, more efficient with uh, everyone muting their uh, phone and their screen so that there's no camera uh, running the, uh, the data either. Uh, all right, Jordy, good morning. Good morning, Ian. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm okay. Good. Uh, I had the stress to put on a collared shirt today. So there you go. <laughs> Not me. Couldn't bring myself to doing it. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I thought this morning what we would do is uh, talk about a few of the questions that have come in right away and uh, start going through some what I would call common errors and pitfalls that we're seeing, and especially in this COVID environment. Um, Jordy, how about maybe recap your week? How did you, in terms of uh, with counterparts now in full force uh, and uh, video uh, well entrenched, uh, how was your week? Yeah, well, I every day with a nice latte, so that was good. Other than that, um, I, uh, <coughs> I did have a counterpart. Hang on a second, I think we got people with them. No, 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 I thought I did, but no. Oh, it's good? Yeah. If everybody could just mute. Maybe Ian, I don't know if you have oh, the ability to just oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. Um so basically uh, I did have my first uh counterpart execution. Um and uh so we had delivered the PDFs to um, to the client and we had our uh, um, the exact time to the second that it was generated so that we could match that to the one that that we were as the witnesses um, assigning and uh, we basically we got on that zoom call uh, we confirmed that they were looking at the um, same exact copy that we were in the sense that the uh, the identifier on the document was the same. And um, then the client, uh, we watched as the client uh, went through it, initialed each page. Uh, when they got to the last page, I asked them to hold up the last page uh, and then sign it where we watched and then hold it back up and acknowledge that as their signature. Um, and then um, I went next and my son was sitting beside me or standing. Um, and then I initialed all the pages. I held up the last page. I said, I'm about to sign it. It's this version. Yes, that's right. And then Spence went next and did that. And at that point, we had, a, I think we had a valid will. The weird thing to me was signing a blank, witnessing a blank page, in a sense. Um, that was a bit disconcerting. I, I kept looking for the testator's signature, something I always did before. Um, cause often, not often, but occasionally a client forgets to sign and I'm about to witness and they haven't signed yet. So, um, so that was what I, uh, I had, uh, did uh, what I did. And, and then they couriered the original, their copy to me and I'm going to do the affidavits of execution. So I'm going to do one, uh, Spence is going to do one where he attaches, uh, where he swears that he witnessed this copy and watched that copy be signed by the testator. And I will do the same. And we're going to use two affidavits in this case, um, just even though probably you don't need to, as long as you can identify that one of you is the uh, LSO member, I, I, I'm going to use two. Um, and the, the other point, um, I don't know if you want to raise this, but there's been some debate in some of the groups that I've seen uh, about whether you can simply just attach the last signature page and my view, and I think it's yours as well, Ian, that you have to, the, the will is going to be the complete copy of all the counterparts, not just the signing pages. Um, I know some, some lawyers are debating that. I, I don't, I don't, I certainly wouldn't take that risk. <laughs> um, and I would, I believe that the intention was that it be, uh, that the copy would be the entire document. And that's one of the reasons I'm with, I'm uh, initialing it so that they can see that it, it is the same document. I agree with you 100% on that. And I, I think on the counterparts, it's better safe than sorry. 
uh, as we move through COVID-19, we'll certainly be starting to look at the other end and thinking about some of the steps we're going to take once we come out of this. Uh, but from my perspective, the counterparts, I, I agree 100%. Now, can you just, because we've had a question on this, and I just want to walk through carefully your thinking on the affidavit of execution. Uh, you're, uh, you're telling us that you're doing two uh, affidavits, uh, and I just wanted to get your thinking on that. And, and because in your case, both witnesses are together when the um, uh, will is signed. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so we have on our blog, um, we have uh, draft, well, sample affidavits of execution um, for this kind of counterpart. And the reason I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I'm not, again, I, I'm not sure you need to have two um, because I think it's, you know, under the current situation, right, we don't need one from each of the witnesses. I think the one that's important is the one that says that um, you're a licensee of the Law Society or somebody, one of the witnesses was a licensee of the Law Society. Um, and it, attaching the two documents, if, if again, if, you, if two of the witnesses are, in this, are together, um, so there's going to be only two quote, documents, right? One signed by the testator, one signed by both witnesses. Um, I, I think in that case, you could probably just go with this one um, affidavit of execution uh, saying, look, we were together um, with the, uh, you know, the two witnesses were together, and I think you could do that. I'm just going to, I mean, if I can do it, I might as well do it. Um, the easier one to get signed, I think, is the one by the by the non-LSO witness, because I can actually commission my son's um, affidavit um, of, of execution. I think that is, a, you know, in my view, it's permitted. Um, I can't obviously commission my own affidavit, but I can commission another affidavit where I'm mentioned in it. Um, and uh, the problem, of course, is getting the one that I signed commissioned. Um, so that's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just think it's, Again, I don't think it's necessary to have two affidavits of execution if you're both in the same room at the same time. I'm just doing it as a matter of course, I guess, caution, abundance of caution. Okay, well, that's helpful, uh, Jordy. And I think uh, from my perspective, I, uh, I'm actually, uh, I did a counterparts and I only did one affidavit of execution. That's why I'm a little more nervous. So I'm glad to talk it through with you. And yeah, my I, wife I, and I, be, I believe that'll be fine. As long as it's, you know, as long as I think it's somebody has to say that they're an LSO member. That's all. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, that was one of the uh, questions that we'd had uh, sent to us. So uh, we've covered it off. Uh, uh, the other thing here, it, we're just uh, one of the other questions that we were uh, asked on early on is this. So um, this dating of the document itself. And uh, in your situation, of course, of a counterpart situation and in a video exchange situation, can you make some comments on your thoughts on dating of the documents? Yeah, so I think um, my view on the dating of the documents, well, in the counterpart situation, the date is going to be the same. Um, uh, so that gets rid of that issue. Um, on the on these two, on the three wet signatures where you watch the testator sign uh, on video, then they courier the original and you get back on the video and sign the exact same cop, the actual cop, um, same document. Um, I, I thought, I mean, my view was that you didn't necessarily have to put the date that the witnesses sign um, if it's established by uh, affidavit of execution. Um, and the reason we sort of went with, with that theory is to, to every third party, the document looks uh, like it would, I mean, there's no evidence that it wasn't signed altogether. Um, and uh, putting different dates on it might just, you know, <laughs> cause, cause concern. Um, I don't think it's wrong to put dates that the witnesses signed. I just, you know, I, I, we've, I think we've been back and forth on this issue. Um, and uh, so I don't, I certainly don't think it's wrong. I don't think, and, and maybe it is wrong not with the dates. I don't know what the right answer is for sure, but 
I, I, that's how I'm, I'm doing it. I'm dealing with the date of execution being the uh, dealt with in the affidavit of execution. Um, okay, so Jordy, when you were saying on the counterparts, one of the questions is um, the, uh, 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 the, on the counterparts, are you initialing your, each page of your will uh, that you're witnessing? I am. Um, I'm, I'm doing it the same, as if, as if the testator just signed it, I'm doing it the exact same way. Um, the reason I'm doing that is that our view is that the probate is going to require, um, uh, confirmation that it was the identical document that was signed. Um, and this just shows that, you know, that I was dealing with a document, the same document I just didn't sign at the end. Um, I just think it's better to have that. Um, the less, I think the more it looks like the old way, the better it's going, the easier it's going to be for the court staff to simply check that off and say, yep, yeah, okay, good. It looks, you know, it's the same sort of thing. We got the three signatures. Yes, they're on different documents. Boom. So that's why I'm, I'm sort of looking forward. I don't think, you know, again, we don't know necessarily all the, what, what the law is going to be on this, but again, it's a more a practical point of view. I'd, I'd rather it'd be easier for a court to probate it without hassle than coming back here and say, okay, now we need evidence that you, you know, you witnessed this whole complete document. That's, that's really where, where my theory is. It's more of a practical concept, I think. Absolutely. And uh, obviously uh, who knows how long this is going to go and these COVID wills uh, are going to resurface uh, in a sense and likely statistically in, into the probate process. So we want to get them through as best we can. All right, uh, so Jordy, then uh, I was wondering if, um, this is a quick chat line here, um, are you doing affidavits of execution uh, similar to that with powers of attorney? And are there any clauses that you need to add to that affidavit, uh, uh, Jordy? I know. Um, <clears throat> so what, um, what I've, created uh, for any ESA users, there's an affidavit, of, I called it an affidavit of witness to distinguish between an affidavit of execution for wills and affidavit of witness for powers of attorney. Um, and so, yeah, it's a very similar, um, and I'll try to call that up and screen share. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I'm, I am doing it because again, the power of attorney is going to look different to a bank um, because of, we're going to have two different, do two documents put together. One you know, one with the grantor signature and one with the witness's signature. And so um, that's why I decided I never did use affidavits of, uh, of witness for powers of attorney. But um, under these circumstances, I think it's going to be important um, because, um, you know, certain, certain banks may want to see that kind of evidence that, you know, their legal department. Um, so I'm just going to call up if I can, if you just give me a moment here. Um, I'm going to call up what we did and then I can share it with everybody so they can see it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I am using that. I think that's going to be even a big challenge. And are you, uh, including that affidavit? So on a counterparts power of attorney, you're, you're having the, uh, additional pages because you've got it. The, the whole document is the counterpart signatures. And as well, are you attaching to the power of attorney your affidavit of witness so that when you go deliver it to the bank, they can see that it was properly counterpart signed and the affidavit of witness is there as well? Yes, that's, that is what I'm doing. Um, so here, I think you should be able to see on my screen, um, the, uh, this is an affidavit of witness. Um, and it's very similar to the affidavit of execution, except that it should say everywhere uh, that it's by it's the grantor and it's power of attorney as opposed to the the will. Um, I just think it's a it's a useful. Uh, the other part, of course, is that um, for it to be valid uh, in counterpart, you need uh, one of the witnesses to be an LSO member. So uh, that's another reason why uh, I think affidavits of X. Of, a witness, we call them, um, uh, are going to be necessary uh, for powers of attorney. And so, Jordy, where can we find these? So this document is in, if you're an e-state user, it's in your portal. Um, 
if it's not, I think uh, maybe we can get that up on the uh, on the Helen Hall and East State blog, and we'll uh, make it available. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll work on that this uh, next day or so. All right. Um, the uh, when you uh, here's some just some questions that are coming in. That's really helpful on the power of attorney now. Uh, uh, and when you will you initial each page of the testator signed copy of the will? That's a good question. I I uh, I don't. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Um, then. Uh, so j just to clarify that, in counterpart, I'm not right. Obviously, where you're doing the the courier by video, yes, but not a counterpart. All right, and uh, Jordy, yesterday's in, in yesterday's uh, in a previous webinar, um, the will on the screen had language at the end. It said, "In witness whereof," which referenced that the will was signed by audiovisual means. Um, the, asked, the question is, I've been using standard language, not referencing audiovisual witnessing. Is that a problem? Uh, provided the affidavit execution references the witnessing process. Uh, no, in my view, it, it, the reason the language, it, it's in there for the counterpart, because the reason, and we, I think we talked a little bit about this, why we were going to change the um, attestation clause for counterpart, because counterpart is only allowed with audiovisual communication technology in those kinds of situations. <clears throat> That's why we've identified it in the, in the will itself, um, being by audio visual. So, but not where we had the three wet signatures will careered around. We didn't think that was necessary. <clears throat> In the counterpart, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's not crucial. I don't think anything yet is crucial. I don't know. Um, but <clears throat> that's why we're doing it in that one because we're identifying that, that is it, while you can clearly see it was done in counterpart. So we better identify A, that it, you know, that this was done by audio visual communication technology, B, that the one of the witnesses was an LSO member. And that's why the attestation clause and testimonial clauses are different. And I can just maybe pull that up um, uh, here. And yeah, share I think it's important. One of the thinking was is that if we're doing it audio visual only uh, without its counterparts, then why, why alert anyone who's going to look at the will as a third party? Uh, it's none of really their business. As long as the affidavit of execution properly identifies it was done by audio visual, the actual will itself didn't need it. But once we layered on counterparts, we, you, we thought we had to add something in. And you've just called up your attestation clause. Why don't you talk about that? Sure. So this is the one for uh, counterpart. And that's why we uh, added in witness where of by audio visual communication techno technology for the testimonial clause. And then the attestation clause, we've also added the audio visual technology and the fact that one of us was a licensee of the Law Society of Ontario. So those were, we thought were important where it was a counterpart. And, you know, the law is that, um, you know, where it appears on the face of the will, there's a presumption of validity, right? So um, that's what we rely on generally, uh, that, you know, if, if it looks like there's two witnesses there, then there's this presumption it was executed properly. Um, and, uh, you know, so the more we can say, we can evidence that I think it's, it's better, but of course the um, not required and no form of attestation is required on a, on a will uh, that's signed by witnesses. Right. And I think one of the questions that's follow up and it's a great one is that, you know, the differentiation for a counterparts will with a different attestation clause is really just a question of practice and best practice uh, is, is impossible to predict right now. Um, the, our thinking, and I mine and yours only, and that and should remain that because uh, there is no real direction on this, is that just because that what's going to happen is this will is going to be, you know, an inch and a half thick or thicker than a normal looking will. It's going to have three wills in it. It's going to be a document that when third parties look at it, it's going to be just different. And, and there's going to be whole pages of blank un, un you know, signed witness, I mean, witness pages and things like that. So we thought that we would just change the attestation clause just to allow third parties to see that. And then, you know, quite frankly, if someone's going to question it further, you could take the order from the court and then from the uh, uh, order and council and say, we're mirroring the order and council here. If you want to look at it, you know, you're just, all you're trying to do is get over the hurdles for third parties to use this document. Uh, you know, 
Would a funeral home want to know what want to see that? Maybe. Uh, would a bank? Probably. Uh, who knows though? And, and all of this is so new because these wills are being created now and, uh, and whether they're going to be used or not used uh, going forward. So that's really the thinking, but I don't think there's a magic wand here uh, by any means on that question. Uh, the, this is something that I found and my, my counterpart signings are, are quite labor intensive. And are we considering charging additional fees for a counterpart signing uh, as opposed to um, a um, regular uh, fee? It's way more difficult. This whole process is way, any of the different options are, you know, the, the uh, three wet signatures currying it around, the uh, counterpart, the incorporation by right, all of them are more labor intensive. And, you know, I, we probably should be charging more to do it. Um, uh, I haven't yet uh, because I use a sort of a flat fee and I stick to it typically. Um, plus I'm learning. <laughs> So, um, but I don't think, I, I think it's proper if you, you know, to say, look, this is much more difficult or it's more difficult and more time intensive um, to do it this way. And so I'm going to have to charge an extra X dollars to do it. Uh, you know, you got to photocopy and you got to do separate affidavits of execution, all of that. Um, so I don't think there's anything yeah, wrong with that. I don't think so either. And the other part of it is, and it's something that, uh, certainly, law pro is encouraging, but I'm I'm going to be in, in, you know in, you know in, encouraging and engaging it when we get out of COVID is that, that I'm going to be reaching out to all of my clients who I did this with and say, look, I think it's a good idea to come back and revisit this and sign it in the old-fashioned way. Um, it's just no matter what, it's going to be uh, these documents are going to uh, are truly stopgap in every way. Third parties are going to struggle with these documents. Courts are going to struggle with these documents, and as I don't think they're improperly done, and I'm not saying they won't survive the test of time. I'm sure they will, but um, it gives you another re outreach from a marketing standpoint to say, listen, I think you should come back in now and let's just, and then at that point, you may revisit the will. You may just resign. Who knows? Uh, but that's another um, uh, outreach issue that you want to consider in, in the terms of your pricing. Um, the other thing okay, is, so, yeah. can I just jump in about this resigning thing? Um, so I think one of the things we'll work on, I'm sure Ian, you and I will um, come up with some sort of language for a limited retainer for re-signing, right? I already sort of have something like that. I know you do as well. And um, so I think that's what we'll circulate when the time comes, um, you know, and so that we can say, look, I'm not, all I'm doing here, all I'm retained to do is re-sign, re-execute the same document. I'm not revisiting your planning or any of those other things. So. Yeah. And I think that's a good, uh, that's exactly what we got to do because we don't want to get caught, but also it gives us an opportunity to say, and by the way, and for example, I had a client who was obviously very anxious and she was elderly and, and wanted to get the will done. And she said, look, you know, I just haven't had a chance to think about my charitable gifting, but I want to make sure this will is done. It's, it's, I've got my peace of mind that my family's looked after, but my charitable gifting, I, I just wasn't ready to make the final call on. So I said, well, look, that's perfect. Like, I'm going to be asking you to see you again when we get out of this uh, face to face to go through this. So put your mind to that. And maybe and if, if you want it, we can revisit at that point. That's where I've got a chance to do an expanded planning retainer as opposed to what you're saying, the limited retainer. So that's great. Um, just letting my dog in. I love the, the joys of uh, live video. Um, OK, the. Uh, um, I guess another comment here, we're definitely planning on recommending clients to come in to resign. We'll charge a small fee for that. And then you like the idea of limited uh, retainer. Uh, so we're sort of, I think a lot of us on this call are on the same page. Um, Jordy, anything else on the limited retainer you want to cover? I just have a couple topics I want to um, uh, uh, talk about uh, just in terms of standard steps we're taking. Nope, I'm good. Okay, so let's just go to the retainer. Uh, Jordy, what, do you have a, a, a fairly standard form retainer uh, that you are uh, agreement that you use with your wills? I do. Um, so the, the retainer uh, is a, so it's a one page retainer uh, that I use. Um, and it's, I mean, it does a couple of things. So for a single client, the only thing it's really doing that's important is limiting the uh my my retainer 
so in other words, I'm not giving tax advice and I'm not giving foreign advice. Um, income tax, I call it income tax planning advice or uh, foreign advice. Um, so that's what my retainer does. It also, I bill a, usually a flat fee and so it has the flat fee and it has uh, a deposit. I use a deposit. Um, so I, before I start working, I get some money from the client um, and um, and I can't post it right now, <laughs> but um, but but one of the things for any estate uh, planner users, uh, well, that's going to be part of your uh, portal. So you can and you can edit it the way you want it, but it will automatically generate retainers. For joint retainers, the other key element, of course, is that it's a joint retainer, and so <clears throat> the there's no confidentiality between uh, the you know among the three. Uh, you and the two clients and uh, anything has to be shared and uh, the fact that you know um, uh, you, can't, you can't keep anything in confidence from one and, and th those are the key elements of, of that, that retainer. Other retainers I've seen go on to talk about disclosure of uh, our I mean, uh, electronic communication, um, uh, other, other things uh, as well, um, which is a good idea I think. Okay, so in that vein, the, the, the limited retainer and the retainer generally, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some clauses that uh, can be, you know, be problematic with the will drafting process. Um, and, and one of them, of course, is the revocation clause uh, in and of itself. Um, and uh, with your primary and secondary wills, uh, are you pay, paying special attention to the revocation clauses and, and how are you doing that? So, yeah, I mean, I typically, in multiple wills, you have the revocation clause, uh, but it's, it's limited in a sense because you're not re revoking the second will that you're about to sign or the one that you just did sign. So uh, the language that you typically see is something about revoking all wills signed prior to today. Um, and, and one of the risks, of course, um, so, uh, you know, that's one way of doing it is you have a revocation clause in both, uh, in both wills. I know uh, some practitioners do use a different system, which is an interesting one. They start, the first thing the client does is sign a document that revokes all prior wills. That's the first thing they do. So it's simply a revocation of prior wills. Then they sign the two new wills um, and with, that have no revocation clause in it. Um, that's another strategy that you don't see widely used, but, um, and, and I believe the concept there is that if you ever need to make a codicil uh, to those wills, you don't have to worry about the codicil screwing up the revocation clause um, and sort of revoking the will that you just signed and that kind of stuff because the codicil can update the, the, the date of the will in essence. So, um, Anyway, that's that's another strategy. I'm not. I, I think practically speaking, uh, it, you know, codicils aren't a great idea for multiple wills. I would avoid them if I could. Uh, in emergency si situations, you need to do them. You can do them. Uh, I think a court would not find that somehow by doing a codicil of will, you've somehow revoked the entire secondary will or whatever. I just I don't think that that's what a court would do. But uh, there's a reason I'm not a judge. So. Um, you know, that, that, that's why we try to avoid them. Uh, so I hope that covered. Absolutely. All right. And so just coming back to the, um, retainer question that, uh, we got another good follow-up piece on that. The, if the re signing is going to take place six months later, um, notwithstanding the limited retainer, do you feel there might be some obligation of the lawyer to make inquiries about changes and, uh, you know, if all the beneficiaries are alive or any, you know, sort of those kinds of uh, general questions or, or you think we'll be able to limit the retainer specifically to the signing itself? I think we'll be able to limit the retainer to the signing itself. Uh, you may want to, <clears throat> what we'll work on probably in is, is a letter to the client that says, you know, uh, uh, just let us know if any of the following things have changed significantly if you want to go to that route. Now, you may not want to go that route. You may say, don't, <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, we're just re-signing this will and we're, and, and it's going to, and any changes won't be planned for. So, 
you know, are you okay with that? And if the client is okay with that, you know, and maybe you want to highlight things that might be important, like the death of a beneficiary or a beneficiary becoming capable or, you know, you know significant change in assets. But then again, you open, you open the door. I think you can rely on a client to limit the retainer. I think that's allowed. Okay. Um, so, uh, one of the things that uh, you've got a sort of your own, and you and I have worked up over the years, uh, our own list of problematic clauses. Um, the, uh, uh, in your mind anyway, um, what do you do when your clients are uh, asking you about funeral instructions and burial wishes? What are you doing with those clauses? Um, First of all, of course, explaining that, uh, that, that whatever you put in the will it will not necessarily be binding. In fact, it's up to the executor. I think it's pretty clear law that it's up to the executor to determine the mode of bur burial and disposition of the body, notwithstanding any uh, expression of wishes in the document. Um, there's some, you know, people debate whether to even put them in since often the will is not found until it's too late in, in essence and, uh, or, or located so nobody knows. Um, you know, I want to be buried. Oh, it's a little late because we cremated, um, and you can't put that back. So, you know, um, that, that's one of the reasons people might not put it in. The other reason is not binding. Um, but I typically ask the client if they'd like to see something in there after explaining that. Yes, I would, you know, or nah, I'll just leave it to the, I trust my executor. If it's crucial, of course, you better pick an executor who's going to follow what you want done, and that I think is, is important. And as a follow-up on that, what do you think of the use of precatory language like that uh, in your wills, uh, not just on the burial, but on uh, gifting and those sorts of issues? So, yeah, I mean, there are situations where I use precatory uh, language about uh, precatory um, wishes. Um, in the sense that, for example, uh, personal effects, I might say, look, I'm leaving it to the discretion of the trustee. Uh, but uh, I'd like them to take into account any memorandum that I or list that I might leave in the future. The one thing I do put in the will uh, is that that list is not part of the will. Uh, um, the reason I'm doing that is because if anybody's found this, the courts are now requiring whenever they see the fact that a memorandum is is referred to, even if it says a future memorandum. The court's saying, well, we need a copy of that because it's part of the will. And we're like, well, no, it's not part of the will. And no, you don't need a copy of that. But that's why I say, I explicitly say that document is not part of the will. And uh, that's really from a probate planning. So we don't have to circulate that and have that form part of the will because the court says, oh, it's in our manual. Um, you know, and even then you get into a bit of a fight that, as to whether that needs to be part of the probate application or not. So I do use precatory language, um, for sure. All right. Uh, obviously, with the video and the counterparts uh, video uh, intake and, and signing, we, we, we've been focusing a lot on the signing. And I think we've been able to sort of wrestle to the ground the steps we need. And we've got strong precedents in terms of making sure the execution works. Uh, working backwards, of course, on the intake piece, with this video intake, um, how are you trying, I mean, we're all trying our best in a, uh, in a you know, difficult environment, uh, just in terms of intake alone. What are you doing to help prevent clerical and typographical mistakes uh, on your intake uh, with a video uh, uh, scenario? Um, well, uh, again, I, I encourage, it's even, even in person, the idea that, that, the, that, the client can see what you're writing down or what notes you're taking or the, the spelling of names is important. So whether you use software or you don't use software and you um, simply call up on your screen um, the way that the names that you're talking about. So for example, like just on a, I'm just going to open up a, a blank uh, document here and um, you know, even if you're, if you're not using any kind of software, um, and in, you know, people know that your software does all this, but you know, if you're, if you're writing, you know, they're saying, okay, tell me who's in your family and you're sharing a screen with the client and they, you know, type in, you know, okay, Philip Jones. And they're like, well, Philip has two P's 
right? If you had written that down in your notes, you'd never know until the will went out and they told you, oh, by the way, you've spelled Philip's name wrong. And you're like, oh, sorry, you know, uh, well, it has two Ps. It's like, well, how did I know that? Well, this is how you know that. The client can see, you know, that, and then if there's a spelling mistake, if, if you know, if, it, if in fact it only had one P, uh, then at least the client recognizes that it was their error and not yours. Um, so spelling names wrong, typographical errors, there's nothing more embarrassing than spelling the client's name wrong or spelling a key member of the family wrong. And, and so much of our practice has been based on us trying to figure out, you know, transcribing and taking notes of details when, you know, if the client just saw it on the screen, they'd be able to correct us. But we don't, you know, historically haven't used that technology. And so, um, you know, the technology, you know, even if you're going to simply share a screen with a blank page on it and write down the key things that you need the client to check, um, so powerful. Powerful not only using video, but powerful when the client is sitting there. And you're, you know, historically people have just sat there and the lawyer's taking notes. Well, the client has no idea if you've taken down the notes properly. Um, so seeing it on the screen is important. And, um, you know, as, as you know, for estate planner users, that this is all right in there. And, and um, you don't have a problem about copying names down wrong. And the client can watch as you type in the names. I have that all the time where I start typing in a name and, they, and I ask them, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. You got it right. Or, oh, no, no, I think the middle name is Gene and their, re their, their first name is Sue. Oh, okay, because you used to call it, you called them Gene and their real name is Sue. Um, so that kind of stuff is really crucial. Yeah, and I think um, the uh, the tool, and I've just fell on, fallen into it. WebEx is good too. Don't get me wrong; that's the other tool that I'm using, sort of from time to time. But uh, with Zoom, screen share. You got to learn how to use screen share of, of anything of the Zoom technology. If you're getting everyone on this has figured out how to get in and then watch us, um, the uh, screen share technology is the other uh, element of it, and it's it literally is open a program have it open on your computer and then go to screen share and screen share and then you can bring up the the, uh, the document uh it's uh it's something to play with maybe if you if you're still struggling with the screen share you know have a friend who's on zoom or something practice with them because uh i know it, many of us can do it on this call but it's such a vital tool to visualize these questions uh and and just have a note in front of the, the client uh it's a game changer on so many levels uh, once, remember, garbage in, garbage out rule always works, right? And uh, you type it wrong once in a will, uh, it's throughout the documents uh, in, in many cases. So, sorry, Jordy, you were going to say something? Yeah, just the other thing is that you can record that whole conversation with the client's permission and the screen share. So, for now on every one of my clients, I have a, a, a video file because what it is, is it's the, well, first of all, it's the client, the camera. And so it's the, if they're on camera and, it, and the other thing is it's a, it's a, it's the screen share. So I can replay, you know, when, when I got to the decision of, and whatever it is, and whether using software or not, you know, when, when we got to the decision of what we were going to do with this trust for the kids, I can watch it and, and listen to what we were talking about. You know, when the client decided, well, we're going to do, you know, a stage lump sum at, you know, 25, you know, we can go back to that. We can listen to it. I even, Say to the client, if you want to watch this again, um, you know, here's the link, and they can go watch the whole video if you want, if you're comfortable with that. So, that the two things, screen sharing and recording, um, I think are really, I mean, may, that's so so important nowadays. I think. And what's your long-term plan here? So, if we're going to create, uh, we, we have these obligations to hold on to these documents for so long. Uh, now we're creating a, a video file. We're creating a. Uh, and, uh, you know, a digital file, uh, what's your long-term play on all of that data and, and its protection and safety? So, uh, you know, all of my, just like my notes I, and my file on a will file, I would be um, keeping it forever. <laughs> and the reality is now it's a lot easier to store it than it was with paper. Um, you know, we used to have uh, will files that were that thick. Now my will files are that thick. It's got an affidavit. It's a spare affidavit of execution in it. Um, you know, and, and of course it's saved. Uh, I mean, we save ours on the cloud and it's uh, secure and it's backed up and all of that stuff, all crucial. Um, 
you know, it's safer than your file, uh, your hard file in many ways. Um, and so uh, I don't have a, yeah, I don't keep a USB for each client. I just have it all saved on a, on my server and it's alphabetical, just like you have your file saved. That's how I have it. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, Jordy, we're, what about, uh, we've been, we've worked over the years, uh, recently with closely with the notice connect people, uh, Patrick's a, a leader in this area, uh, yes. in the digital area. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience with notice connect is, uh, talking about digitizing this process, both from the, uh, notice, uh, tools that they have and also their, uh, will, uh, registry. Um, yeah, Patrick is a real thought leader in this area. And, um, uh, so we, I really respect what he's done. And so, um, the first part of it is this idea of uh, ad for creditors. Uh, so if any of you uh, are familiar with it, the, the idea is now rather than publishing, um, you know, an advertisement for creditors on three occasions in a, in a p newspaper of wide circulation, um, you simply, for once, you post it with Notice Connect, they publish it, so it's available to creditors, um, and, uh, and that satisfies, uh, in my view, it satisfies, and I think the courts have confirmed this, that it satisfies your obligation to advertise for creditors to the extent that you're, you're, you have that protection. Um, you know, that law about advertising in newspapers is uh, well over, well, it's 200 years old, um, and so it's probably, you know, the fact that you can do it now with a much, much less expensive way and um, in a, a more efficient way uh, is great. So there's that, that part of Notice Connect and, and the advertisement for creditors. And then there's the Canadian Will Registry, which is a, a wonderful idea and, um, and really well executed. And that is, if you are holding wills, um, you can register them in the Canadian Will Registry. And the information, basically, nobody can access your information. It's only, if, so you, you upload the name of the client, um, certain other information. If anybody is looking for, and you're not charged for that. So you could upload all of your wills for no charge. And in fact, I think Notice Connect will actually come in and help you do all that for you. Um, and, and, and then when somebody's looking for the will of John Smith, um, you will get an email that somebody's looking for a will that you've drafted, and then you can decide what to do about that. So it's a private situation, not, it doesn't go out to everybody, oh, so-and-so is looking for a will, it's, it's targeted. Um, and it's a really a great idea, it's well overdue, um, and uh, very little risk, and the only time, basically, as I understand it, the charging system is you charge when you're looking for a will. Uh, rather than posting in the ORs and hoping somebody's going to actually read that, um, in this case, it's targeted to the people who have that will. Uh, and so, um, uh, it's a wonderful idea. It's, uh, there's, they have hundreds of thousands of wills. Um, uh, I don't know what number they're at yet, but I know that's hundreds of thousands uh, of wills and it's, uh, it's going to be, you know, I think it's going to be a, a wonderful tool. Yeah, and, and I can just say personally, I put ours in just because it's a peace of mind, uh, big time for us. And my dad practiced for 50 years or more, and uh, and we've accumulated, and it's a it's a big uh, a relief uh, to have that registry. But anyway, it's a good tool and an important tool for us as estate practitioners to know about whether we use it or to what extent. I I, I do believe strongly that it's probably expected that you would use the. Uh, creditor notification tool because uh, it's it's significantly cheaper for the client and uh, has been sanctioned by the court by a, a actual decision on this by Justice Conway. Um, just to come back to just sorry one other point about this advertisement for creditors. The reason it, it's even better is they are linked to the made to major creditors. So um, in, in a sense, that's why the creditors like it. They pay a fee so that they can. Um, you know, get a list of these people. So you're probably more likely to actually have creditors come out uh, using Notice Connect. Well, that's great. Uh, just coming back to the uh, precatory memo, uh, we've got a great point here on the on the chat line that the 2020 Estates Procedure Manual says that 
a precatory memo does not have to be filed with the application for certificate of appointment. Of course, though, you can get court staff who will still ask for it. That's the that's the dilemma. The human nature uh, or the human uh, flaw of uh, any rule can be overruled. All right. Um, so, Jordy, can we um, just looking at our time? We just uh, we'll just offer up uh, some uh, any other additional questions. But um, the last area I just wanted to cover briefly um, is just the uh, the whole uh, codicil option now. Don Carr, who we all love and know and has been around for a long, long time, uh, wrote a, a strongly worded blog this week, uh, and it's been uh, circulated pretty heavily about the fact that he doesn't think the um, uh, the, the changes have been are, are helpful because a lot of his clients and, and a lot of our clients are elderly and they don't have the video technology and they don't have the ability to get the access to video. And so his uh, theory, it seems to me, was largely exp uh, exposing the view that we should just be doing codicils. And I've got a lot of respect for Don, and uh, it's obviously a, a, one of the tools that we should be considering. And I know we've got, uh, we've got when we came out early with COVID, uh, setting out some of the, the steps to, to, uh, to consider a codicil. So can we just spend a couple minutes on the codicil and uh, that as a tool and also um, uh, uh, holograph wills is another option. And, and, and just some of the protective steps we can take if we're going to use codicils and or uh, holograph wills. Right, and, and it, for sure, you know, that, that is, a, Don has identified a, a major problem, which is that you can't, you can't use a counterpart if you can't use audio-visual technology. So um, we wrote a blog a little uh, at the beginning of this about the use of uh, a holograph will to incorporate by reference a formal typed will um, and our view was it should be allowed it, it, from a legal concept point of view it should be acceptable we do point out um, the the case uh, in Ontario uh, called Facey and Smith which uh, Don as well uh, raised which you know uh, said that you, you can't do it that way um, we believe it was over there that when the court said that and, and we believe that it was wrongly decided, but that's still out there. And so that's why, um, you know, we're, we were a little, there's a little hesitation in using that strategy. Um, but we do have a whole blog on that strategy um, and a client instruction sheet if you're going to use that strategy. Um, so you could, um, you can sort of use this, uh, this sort of instruction sheet for how the client is to do it. Um, so um, but yeah, I take Don's point. Uh, I have the utmost respect for Don, and and I agree with him in the sense that uh, you know this counterpart thing doesn't doesn't work uh, in certain circumstances when there's no when the technology doesn't uh, isn't usable. So um, this is it's still a potential uh, useful strategy with caveats of you know of this Facey and Smith case. But if you want to look at our blog on this, we we go into why we think it's valid. Um, and, and basically we agree with Don. And uh, to go further, uh, uh, Jordy, you, we also have done a, a blog on, um, on both uh, using the uh, amethysis and the codis, I mean, uh, holograph will and doing a holograph will. And maybe if you could just take a, a minute just to walk through those two resources so people have it uh, handy uh, in terms of uh, those two tools. So the amanuensis is, is the idea that somebody else is uh, signing on behalf of the testator. And um, I'm just going to go to that blog, but we did a blog on that. Um, and this is actually the link is, yes, there it is. Um, that uh, under the Succession Law Reform Act, the testator can actually direct someone else to, to sign on their behalf, which you, you could do and then all have, have, the witness and the and the testators uh, amanuensis uh, all sign on the same document. So that's a strategy that we've allowed or that we talk about. Um, again, the direction has to be in the presence of uh, the, so the testator has to direct the amanuensis at at the um, in the presence of one another. So that means you need audiovisual communication technology still to do that. Um, and so this is sort of, we've, 
we've identified sort of uh, how you can do this um, in that strat using that strategy. Um, so if you want to check out the blog, we have that as well. That's another strategy you can use. And the strategy of using just a good old fashioned holograph wheel. Right. So and we've got, we also built out uh, uh, some uh, resources for that. Yes, we did. And I've got, just got to find them. <laughs> so there's, a, I think it's on the Hull and Hull blog. Uh, and I'll just yeah. call that. But yeah, you can just use a, a holograph wheel. Um, if it's a simple situation, um, you know, that works fine. And we do have some suggestions on what should be in that holograph uh, document as a minimum. Um, so, um, and I will try to call that up uh, while we continue to uh, talk. No, no, no problem. I, I'm, I'm throwing these at you and uh, uh, it's not exactly been queued up in advance. Um, all right, well, look, uh, while you're doing that, we'll finish up that resource. And um, unless anybody else has any other questions, uh, just comments. Just going to screen share yep. that. So here is the uh, blog um, and what we think should be in there. Um, and here's the, there's a link to this um, instructions on making a holograph will that you could send to the client um, with some sample language. Um, so that's that's available on the uh, on the blog as well. Perfect. Well done catching that so quickly. All right. Well, look. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this week. I think we've covered off uh, some of the recent trends and some also some of the uh, historic uh, issues that uh, state planning uh, lawyers are facing uh, every day and certainly in this crazy COVID uh, nineteen environment. We look forward to next Friday morning at 8.30 to continue our discussion and our dialogue. And again, thanks so much everyone for joining in. And Jordy, thanks for all your help. Thank you. Have a great Thank weekend. You. Take care everyone.